It's the day before a full moon, and these are pilgrims. For the last three months, traditionally the monsoon months, monks have been keeping what's called the rain retreat. Now it's nearly over, and up there in the forest hermitage of Wateruila, preparations are being made to welcome the laity once again. I first knew the procession had started when I heard this extraordinary surging whisper. It must have been about two in the morning. Under the canopy there, you can just see a bale of cloth. At the end of the rain retreat, the monks get new robes. That cry of sadhu, sadhu, sa, it seems impossible to translate. Something between may you be happy, well done, and amen. In an assembly hall under a jutting rock sit the monks of Watruwila, some from the main house and some from small hermitages hidden away all over the island. These are forest-dwelling monks, and the paradox is that, having forsaken society, they seem in some extraordinary way to draw society after them. If you looked at those requisites that are brought by the people, you find that each one brought according to his own means. The poorest brought a cake of soap, or maybe even a broom. And I saw a piece of neatly folded brown paper, a ball of string, an exercise book, and a bottle of cough mixture. People who have given their gifts and people who have no gifts to give line the route and touch the presents as they go by. So everybody shares in the merit. The main ceremony was over by daybreak, but the pilgrims lingered on for the sideshows and to talk to the monks and take guided tours around the buildings and make a day of it. Some of these ladies had booked a year in advance for the privilege of bringing and cooking the monks' food for the day. Dr. Ratnapala translated. Well, could she tell me, first of all, about the five precepts? Mm. First is not to kill any animals. Not to kill any animals yes. at all. So is she is she a vegetarian? Me oh. with She eats fish also. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But the merit of the day's cooking would presumably help her do better in her next birth, and she prayed I'd do better in mine. So as uh, does she think that because I've been born in England as a Christian, that I've done something wrong in my former life. She says, yes, that you have done something bad in the other life and you have been born in a country like that. Is there hope for me? <laughs> If you, if you uh, exercise a lot of effort now and get into the right path, you will never be born in a country like that <laughs> again. <laughs> Here are two boys with a remarkable aptitude for ancient languages. They chant and translate from Pali and Sanskrit. Some say you can't account for such accomplishments in the space of one short life. At an early age, these boys talked of being in a bus crash. Bit by bit, a story was pieced together about the death of two Tibetan monks in India and their rebirth here as twins. In the middle of these celebrations, 
I found myself comparing the relationship of these monks and these laymen with the relationship of a town and its football team. The spectators aren't players and probably could never be. The players are in some ways idolized, in some ways trapped. What they do out there on the pitch is something very special to them and they can't be either interrupted or helped while the game is at its height. But now and again, the spectators are let onto the field and there's a great jostling celebration. Then, for the monks, back to simplicity. I'd met a newly ordained American monk who talked about simplicity. The reason that you give up things, or in classic terms you renounce, is so that you don't have too many things around you to distract you from what you should be doing, which is investigating yourself. First you have to find out who you are as yourself, and then you can get about the business of eliminating yourself. But uh, at the state of the world now, the main thing is to find out who we are and what we are. And what we do lead is uh, lives that are much too complicated, much too complex, much too cluttered. So that if one is going to start to take up a spiritual practice, or one is going to start to uh, meditate, one has to uh, literally sit down in, uh, in, in an empty mental room. And to start to create an empty mental room, you have to start to create an empty physical room. So you have to start to clear out the unessential. Getting the impression that a Buddhist is almost looking through a spyglass, which is his mind, is almost seeing the whole world and everything through this lens of yes. the mind. Yes. So when you say purify the mind, is it the same as saying clean your lens? Um, clean your glasses? Well, it is somewhat like that. Then you can see clearly. If you purify your mind, then you can see the nature as it is, as real it is, the world as it is. There's the realization. So you would call Buddhism a severely practical thing of seeing the world as it is, yes. not seeing it painted gold no, or pink? No, no, no. You have to penetrate all the appearances. You have to penetrate it. And the Buddhist device for penetration, said Ananda Maitreya, is the noble eightfold path, the eight spokes of a wheel. Right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration, right thought, right understanding. So, and he used the eight spokes of his parasol to make the point, while we are tied to the cycle of birth and rebirth, we are on the perimeter. As we take the noble eightfold path, we move, bit by bit, down the spokes to the still point at the center. No more birth, no more rebirth, Nirvana. When I asked a well-respected Buddhist monk about Nirvana, he said, you can no more describe Nirvana than a frog can describe dry land to a shoal of tadpoles. And he went on to elaborate. Even the cleverest tadpole, he said, can only ask questions about the element he lives in. And all the frog's answers are going to seem negative. No, uh, dry land doesn't have fish. No, you can't float over it. No, fresh air is not like water. Until the tadpoles get the idea that he is describing some impossible, negative nowhere. With earthly thought, said the monk, you cannot think nirvana. From nirvana, you cannot think an earthly thought. In other words, don't look to the Buddha for help with the harvest, help with money, help with a job. Look to the Buddha for help with the truth. No wonder people in need of immediate benefits and immediate comfort 
need gods to resort to. The shrine of the god Dadimunda, at a remote spot in the centre of the island. These women claim to be possessed by good spirits, and they've come to have their possession confirmed by the shrine priest. Now it's all over, they can go back home with heightened prestige. And when the spirit speaks through them, they'll be listened to. For the Westerner, even if he doesn't believe in God, God is one and almighty. To approach God Dadimunda or any of the countless other sprouting gods in Sri Lanka, you somehow need to uproot your Western conditioning. Think of the gods as fairies, said Dr. Ratnapala. Not the sugar plum versions of recent times, but the awesome presences of the old fairy tales. Think of the gods as ghosts. Think of the gods as friends in the town hall. Very useful for building permits, but no help when it comes to the great matters of birth and rebirth. <laughs> I said to Ananda Maitreya, how do you as a Buddhist monk react when Buddhist laymen go to the gods for favors? It's not my business. I'm neutral. Yet the ceremony started with respects to the Buddha, the shrine priest is a Buddhist layman, and the people in general would be outraged if anybody suggested they weren't regular Buddhists. So, and this took time to sink in, Gods inhabit this universe as surely as a man and his ox. They can't bring you to Nirvana because they don't know the way. The way is the noble eightfold path of the Buddha. The noble eightfold path of the Buddha unfolds with meditation. Meditation penetrates appearances and reveals the world for what it is. Now slowly you begin to understand that your mind is a changing process, a flux, a flow of thoughts or thinkings, mere actions, mere activities. At last you understand the so-called man is a mere phenomenon. What is there is a process of vibrations. Apart from vibrations there is nothing. If a man says to you, I know this table is real, what would you say? Well, when a man dreams that he is touching a table, till he wakes up, it is real to him. So what we have to do is to wake him up. <laughs> would you then describe religion as a waking up device? Yes. What we have to do is not to argue with that man, to make some sort of arrangement to open his eyes. Illusion then depends on a person waking up within himself, not receiving yes. somebody else's word, no. waking up within himself. Yes. Well, we know the whole world is a mass of vibrations. Actually, there is nothing solid. We are so deluded. We see the solidity, which is actually not there. <laughs> It is somewhat like measuring a dream by another dream. <laughs> the
The last place we visited in Sri Lanka was a cave settlement near Dambulla that's been occupied by monks for over 2,000 years. Bhikkhu Paramananda was a clerk on a tea plantation till he was over 40. Then he became a bhikkhu. His cave contains a hard bed and a few books. The inscription over the door is from the 2nd century BC and records the name of the patron who first made it possible for a monk to live here. Four monks live here in a vast community of insects and animals. Bhikkhu Soma, also a forest monk, spent eight years as a student engineer in Chelsea, London. What things in particular do you miss now? Can you well, give me an example? Um, all comfortable living, like uh, driving cars and living in a nice comfortable house and a bed. And these things as well as a lot of other interests, uh, technical interests and uh, studying, reading and uh, freedom. Mostly. Is your life here very, very controlled? I mean, morning till night? Um, I should say up to a certain extent, yes. Is uh, it very serious? Uh, yes, very serious, because uh, if there's any um, allowance, uh, there'll be a lot of disobedience. Do you have jokes? Yes. <laughs> They're not all that uh, sort of uh, boring and unhappy. We are also happy. We crack jokes and laugh about. And of course we practice meditation too, but we are in a confined place. Because with the society if we do that, society will lose the respect towards us. Do you ever want to leave? Uh, that's uh, unpredictable. You haven't so far? Uh, mm. Sometimes I should say, as a matter of fact, there was certain temptation came out to me and uh, pushing me like, and I know it's those are weaknesses that I have. Uh, the idea of Buddhism is to build up the resistance towards that sort of temptation where I should we'll go back. I mean, we can't go back to childhood, really. But it's an illusion if you try. The key word in Buddhist meditation, said Bhikkhu Parvananda, is mindfulness. When you're walking, know that you're walking. When you're sweeping, know that you're sweeping. When you're worrying, know that you're worrying. And when you're breathing, and you must be breathing, know that you're breathing. Because it's with breathing that your meditation starts. The Buddha said, it's the duty of a monk to teach and preach for the good of the many, for the happiness of the many, out of compassion for the world. What Bhikkhu Parabhananda taught me is that a man can preach a great sermon without ever opening his mouth. 